Consider an egg, an absolute marvel of biological engineering, a fortress of calcium carbonate, yet fragile enough for what's inside to break out 21 days from now. Seemingly waterproof, but yet the shell has 17,000 pores through which gases are exchanged. Inside this, a yellow liquid yolk filled with every nutrient required to grow an entire bird from scratch. Surrounded by a reservoir of translucent protein that also serves as a shock absorber for the life growing inside. Just one problem. Most of what I said is not true for this egg. You can keep this in a warm place for as long as you like. No chick is going to hatch because this is an unfertilized egg. Actually, every egg you buy in the supermarket is an unfertilized egg. No chicks inside, no growing life. Let's understand this through the lens of another source of animal protein Indians are very familiar with, milk. Mammals produce milk when they give birth. To give birth, they need to get pregnant. And to get pregnant, the female has to uh, meet a male of the species or be artificially inseminated, as is usually the case with milk producing cows. To get this unfertilized egg, you have to do the exact opposite. You have to prevent a male rooster from saying hello to the female hen. Like female mammals, female birds produce an egg during their ovulation cycle. The term ovulation literally means production of an egg. If they did not encounter a male during that cycle, the egg that is laid is unfertilized. And that is what we eat. We don't eat fertilized eggs. To be fair, centuries ago in villages, the farmer might not entirely be sure if the eggs he or she found in a nest are fertilized or unfertilized. So once in a while, people likely consumed eggs that had a growing chick inside. Again, if the egg was fresh, the embryo is not even visible to the naked eye. And that egg is nutritionally similar. But in modern times, any poultry operation has full control over whether or not eggs are fertilized or not. In fact, the entire goal of the egg business is to prevent hens from using Tinder and meeting boyfriends. So if milk produced by forcing a cow to get pregnant, give birth, lactate, and then you collect it, is vegetarian, eggs should be vegetarian. The reason they're not considered vegetarian is purely cultural, not scientific. So let's redo the introduction to the modern day unfertilized egg from a cooking standpoint. Consider the absolute miracle that is the egg. It is without a shadow of doubt the single most versatile ingredient in the Indian kitchen. Nothing comes close. This ovoid ball of 75% water and 25% magic can be scrambled into an unctuous burji, pan fried into a pillowy masala omelette or a sunny side up, whipped with sugar into a delicious desert air, emulsified into mayonnaise, set into ice cream and cooked to every possible combination of texture and mouthfeel. It is a source of a stunning diversity of proteins, even more so than meat or dairy. And in particularly South and East India, one of the cheapest sources of high quality protein. For a country where the chicken was originally domesticated, egg consumption was historically restricted to South and East India, where farming communities would collect and consume eggs. They were rarely sold at scale. Now, fast forward to 1981. There is a sizable poultry industry, but not doing too well. About 40% of the poultry farms in India have gone out of business. Operation Flood by Varghese Kurian has recently given the Indian milk industry a complete makeover. And inspired by that success, Dr. B.V. Rao of Venkateshwara Hatcheries decides to mobilize a similar operation for the egg industry. Consequently, a cooperative movement, National Egg Coordination Committee, NECC for short, was born. Anyone old enough will remember this popular television advertisement 
with the catchy jingle sunday ho ya monday rose khao ande a lot of print advertisements promoting the consumption of eggs were run people with special nutritional needs like mothers pregnant or nursing women and children were the key focus of a lot of these advertisements novel recipes like egg chart were introduced and that was when the idea of putting an egg inside every serving of biryani was introduced the egg is cheaper than meat and also came as a surprise to people digging into the biryani and finding it literally like an easter egg and by 2024 egg consumption has doubled in the last 20 years and grown by 100 times in the last 60 years while meat consumption has not grown that fast almost half of all eggs produced in india are from just three states telangana andhra and tamil nadu so let's start with this basic question what makes an egg so amazing from a nutritional standpoint for starters it is one of the best sources of high quality animal protein and unlike milk which many adults in india have trouble digesting eggs can be eaten at any age you can also make a huge variety of dishes with egg actually you can just take any dish and add two fried eggs on top and that's 12 grams of protein with just the addition of 200 calories eggs are also remarkably micronutrient dense in addition to protein and fat eggs have iron calcium phosphorus fat soluble vitamins like a and d and water soluble vitamins like thiamine and riboflavin all this in a 50 gram package at just 80 calories so let's assume you are an absolute beginner cook and you have bought eggs and want to cook them in various different ways so i invited ayushi gupta mera who is an agricultural economist food and beverage consultant travel writer and the creator behind the foodie diaries where she shares easy everyday recipes and more let's start with the most basic one boiled egg now while people in southeast asia and east asia prefer a runny yolk indians usually do not so if you like a soft boiled egg with a runny yolk just bring water to a gentle boil carefully place the egg inside set a timer for 6 minutes take it out and this is optional cool the egg down in an ice bath if ice is too much work just wash the egg under tap water to cool it down remember that the egg continues to cook after you take it out of the pan if you like a hard boiled egg set the timer for 13 minutes and do the same thing also try every combination between 6 and 13 minutes and see what you like let's understand what happens when you cook eggs the white and the yolk are made of different kinds of proteins and crucially cook at different temperatures as the water reaches 62 celsius the egg white turns translucent and starts to set what's actually happening here is called denaturation proteins are generally large complex three dimensional molecules made of chains of building blocks called amino acids as heat is applied water molecules with high energy slam into these protein molecules and uncoil them and these straighter chains tend to clump together more easily that's why proteins get tougher when heated raw meat for example has a softer and elastic feel while cooked meat is harder and chewier same with eggs or paneer as the temperature increases to 68 celsius the yolk proteins will start to set and the whites will start to turn opaque as it denatures the runny yolk takes on a soft and waxy texture at the start and if you continue applying heat it will turn into a crumbly texture that we are familiar with from hard boiled eggs and with more heat the whites will start to generate some hydrogen sulfide gas a smell that we tend to associate with overcooked eggs so a soft boiled egg will not smell eggy if you continue cooking well past this point the sulfur will react with the iron present in the yolk to form ferrous sulfide which is green gray in color and gets deposited between the whites and the yolk of an overboiled egg don't worry even this is perfectly healthy to eat 
just not very tasty. The advantage of boiled eggs is that you can boil a large number and refrigerate them for a few days. So you always have ready-made protein to add to your food without cooking effort. But you will get bored of boiled eggs. So what else can you do? The next simplest thing, scrambled eggs. Again, I'm going to show you the way most Indians prefer their scrambled eggs. If you like it less cooked, just take it off the heat a little bit sooner. Break an egg or two, add milk or cream, salt and pepper or any spices you want and whisk the egg very well. When you whisk, the protein structures uncoil and then the water-loving amino acids want to be closer to water and the water-hating amino acids want to stay away from water. So they end up trapping air into this protein water suspension. So when you cook it, the air bubbles make the texture more like a fluffy idli and not rubbery. Once you have whisked it, just add butter to a non-stick pan, add the egg mixture and let the bottom cook for just a bit before you mix it and break it up and take it off the heat quickly. You can alternatively skip the whisking and just break an egg directly into a non-stick pan with heated butter and fry your egg on just one side. This is a sunny side up or fried egg as it's known in some places. The yolk in this case is likely to be runny. And to take things to the next level, let's make an omelette. There are many ways of doing this. The French and Japanese take their omelette making skills very seriously, but we are going to keep it very Indian. I'm going to give you a food science hack to make the softest omelettes. You break eggs, add salt at least 30 minutes before you make the omelette and let it sit. The salt will uncoil some of the proteins ahead of time so that when you cook the egg, it will set more evenly and lend a softer texture to the omelette. Then chop some onions, chilies and any other veggies you want and saute them in a pan. Then add the egg mixture and some butter. As the butter melts, the water in it becomes vapor and adds more air bubbles to the omelette. And now this is optional, but if you scrape from the edge and tilt the pan so that the uncooked egg gets into those gaps, you get a more evenly cooked and more layered omelette. Now, if you saute vegetables and then do what you did with scrambled eggs, you get a burji. A failed omelette is often a burji. And finally, the trickiest of egg cooking methods, poaching. The internet is filled with a lot of hacks. So in cooking, there are many ways to get to the same outcomes. Bring water to a gentle boil, then add some vinegar. Now I've seen some people do this without vinegar as well, but I think the acid in the vinegar rapidly denatures, cooks the outside of the egg whites so that it stays whole. Now let's address some of the most common egg related myths. One. Egg yolk will increase your cholesterol. It's a pity that this myth has resulted in so many people discarding the yolk and eating just egg whites. The most nutrition dense part of the egg is the yolk. That is where all the vitamins and minerals are. Yet, yes, it does have fat, but experts now believe that there is no connection between cholesterol you eat and bad cholesterol in your blood. The latter is a function of genetics, poor overall lifestyle and diet, and has nothing to do with egg yolks. A number of recent studies have confirmed that eating eggs as part of an overall healthy diet does not increase the risk of heart problems. One of these studies looked at 177,000 people in 50 countries. It found no significant associations between eating egg and cholesterol levels, death rates, or major heart attacks. The study also found no significant link between how many eggs someone ate and their cholesterol levels. So eat the whole egg. Two, brown eggs are healthier than white eggs. This is not true. The color of the eggshell is a function of the hen's genetics. They are all the same nutritionally. Three, dark colored yolks are better than pale yellow yolks. Again, not true. The color of the yolk is a function of the hen's diet. More carotenoids in the diet gives the yolk a darker orange color. That's all. Four, organic eggs are healthier than regular eggs. Again, 
not true. In some situations, a free-range hen can lay eggs with a tiny bit more omega-3 fatty acids depending on its diet, but the difference is very insignificant. In a general sense, the difference between cheaper and more expensive eggs is not nutritional, but the buyer's ability to afford to pay for less industrial scale production. When it comes to eggs, you pay more for less cruelty. Five, nowadays they use hormones to make the hens lay more eggs. This is again not true. Egg laying frequency has been improved simply by selective breeding over the last hundred years. Hormones are expensive and do not really improve egg laying capacity. All that said, the one thing that we should be concerned about is the overuse of antibiotics in poultry farms. They can result in the evolution of antibiotic resistant bacteria and any residues left in the meat can affect your gut microbiome. Note, the latter is not a serious concern yet because most antibiotics are flushed out of any animal naturally in a few days. So before we end, let's answer this eternal question. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Actually, it's an easy question to answer. It is the egg. At some point of time in the past, a bird that was not a chicken laid an egg that hatched a chicken. Eggs have been around for much longer. And I'll leave you with this astonishing bit of evolutionary engineering. The shape of the egg, where it's wide at one end and narrow at the other, has two benefits. One, the arch-like curve distributes pressure evenly across the surface, making the egg surprisingly strong against end-to-end -end pressure. This is crucial for the protection of the chick growing inside. Again, not this egg because this is unfertilized. Two, if an egg is nudged or begins to roll, the shape causes it to travel in a curved path, often circling back to its starting point. This is useful in preventing eggs from rolling out of the nest. In summary, in the words of a famous subreddit, take any dish and put an egg on it.